happy to introduce a colleague. Um, Rick is my colleague at Bloomington Schools. And last year we started talking about school safety. We had a speaker here at Rotary. And I said, gee, you know, maybe Rick should come talk to us. So let me introduce you to Rick Hoffman. He's an 18 year veteran of school communications and public relations. He's the executive director of community relations for Bloomington Schools. He formed formerly served the same role for Colorado's largest public school system, where he led the crisis response team to um, Columbine High School in April 1999. Very interesting story. Uh, Rick is a nationally respected consultant on crisis management and communications, media relations, community engagement, communication planning, and tax and le levy referendum campaigns. He's provided media relations and crisis management and counsel and training to the U.S. Bureau of Prisons for the Timothy McVeigh execution, the New York Education Commission, the New York City schools following the terrorist attacks on September uh, 2001, the U.S. Department of Education, FEMA, the Los Angeles Office of the FBI, the Wisconsin Health and Hospital Association, and numerous universities and state emergency management agencies. Obviously a fabulous background, lots of good stories. I had to read it because I wouldn't, I would have missed half of that. So thank you very much for being here today and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. And uh, Stephen, I have your $20 to pay you back for that uh, commercial. I appreciate that. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here to uh, talk with you, spend a few minutes with you, talk about school safety. I wish we were talking about something else, um, but this is an area that is uh, something that we uh, in schools and I think our communities are really aware of for a variety of reasons. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail about uh, my background. I'll throw it up on the screen, but it's uh, 33 years working in emergency management and 28 years in school district. Um, started in Wisconsin, moved out to Colorado and, and made my way back to the Midwest. Um, in my early career, I was a certified emergency medical technician and was going to school as a paramedic working in an ambulance service in the Wisconsin Dells area where I grew up for the most part after moving there uh, when I was about seven years old from Japan. Um, working as part of the emergency management world, I come from a family of educators as well, so when an opportunity opened up to go work in a public school system, I was able to marry those two uh, avocations and really uh, love for trying to help people out and help uh, as educator. I'm not a teacher. I have uh, been mainly in the, in the uh, administrative side, communications and emergency management. Right time, wrong place, or wrong place, right time, I found myself uh, in Jeffco Public Schools in Colorado in 1990, fall of 1998 and seven and a half months later was on campus at Columbine High School, one of 17 high schools in the school system of 150 schools spread out over 795 square miles, 85,000 students. Columbine High School was in the far south part of the, the school district. I happen to live in the Columbine community as well, so it was not only near and dear to my heart, um, but it was my community, if you will. I was on scene shortly after the first shots were fired where two students laid siege on a school, ultimately killing 12 students, classmates of theirs, a beloved teacher coach, uh, before taking their own lives and wounding 24 others. At that time, in, in April, on April 20, 1998, was the worst school shooting tragedy that uh, we experienced here in the United States. I like to think that that was going to be the last one, but I remember talking with folks afterwards as we assessed for uh, the, what we really uh, uh, dealt with is that there was going to be a worst time when, this, uh, when school tragedy would continue to, to occur. So why are we still talking about school safety? This in, 20, in 2018, as these pop up, these are all the school shooting locations including Parkland, Florida, and Santa Fe High School, suburb outside of Houston, Texas. Over 20 individuals were murdered and quite a few others were injured. So in the red are the colleges, universities, um, community colleges also had shootings. So 2018 was the worst 
year for school tragedies um, since 1999. We had more student deaths and staff deaths and injuries than we've had in the last nearly 20 years. So that's why we continue to talk about school safety. The reality is that students spend 35 hours a week on average in a school, second only to the home. So why school safety on the top of mind concern for parents and staff is because what we experienced last year. Even though overall school shootings, school uh, mass violence has decreased in 20 years, we can continue to deal with those types of issues. The reality is, is that not only is it a top of mind concern, but school districts after each one of these incidents are constantly looking at how do we improve school safety and security. And in Bloomington Public Schools, in 2013, thanks to those of you in the room and our residents, they supported a referendum that provided uh, millions of dollars towards technology and school safety. It's allowed us to be, uh, put our schools into safe conditions. It allowed us to make significant changes. Each year since 2014, when the funding came through our schools, we have continued to improve uh, upon not only the physical structures of them, but also training and drills because it is a multi-layered approach that we have. What we train staff or what we talk with staff about and the reality also with parents is that a crisis, a school crisis, it's unpredictable, but it's not unexpected. As Debbie said in part of the bio, I work with school districts across the country. I'm often called shortly after the school shootings to provide assistance and consult, including Sandy Hook Elementary School, San Bernardino, and then most recently at uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Helping them to understand not only what they are experiencing, but what to do, what are they going to experience as they go through the, the process. In Bloomington, our emergency operations and safety plan is modeled after that which the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and U.S. Department of Education has identified as the four critical areas to emergency management. So I want to be able to share with you those elements and then specifically what we're doing in the school district today. So these are the four areas, the prevention mitigation. This is where we look at reducing and eliminating the risk to life and property. The programs that we have implemented in the school district not only promote social behavior, pro-social behaviors, but also address anti-social behaviors and mental health conditions that students have that they, they uh, some, in some cases, really significant prevention programs, mitigation programs, preparedness, planning for the worst, hoping for the best, having significant planning, which I'll talk to you about as well, uh, along with our training and drills. Our response, now that you have a crisis, what are we doing? And how are we prepared to respond to those kinds of incidents? And lastly, the recovery piece. This is the piece where oftentimes when schools deal with a crisis, where they call uh, for help is because once you've been through an incident, you have that collective sigh of relief that in for many cases we have survived. What we do in Bloomington and what we counsel as school district that have been through this, we have learned a lot I've seen 20 years, um, we focus on the response, not the threat. We could spend a great deal of time trying to ever identify every potential uh, casualty or mass crisis incident, or even if you consider the spectrum of emergencies that school districts deal with, the Columbine and Sandy Hooks of the world are very rare. It is those kinds of things like a lost student, a runner sometimes, a uh, student that doesn't want to be in school. It could be an accident, it could be an unfortunate suicide, those kinds of things that we deal with. Those are far more common. And while they're mini crisis, it does entail a lot of work and to ensure that our students and staff remain safe. So we don't focus on the sources of threats or the, all the potential kinds of things that go wrong. We focus on the response because the response is really critical to understanding how people Thank you. How people will respond and react to a situation. We train our staff to think like gardeners, not mechanics. Mechanics have a tendency to want to hone in on one specific issue. When it comes to the types of crisis that we deal with, it's so critically important that we have a staff that are prepared in how to respond to any kind of threat. When I was a paramedic running in an ambulance, we never knew exactly what we were coming upon. Oftentimes it was a call of an accident and I had a fortunate that I had a younger brother who um, 
we were in the same uh, ambulance squad together. And so we worked very closely. And what we would do is go through mentally and then verbally talk about what it is that we are going to do. That's acting like a gardener. You're tending to lots of different issues preparing for when you get on site. Because once you're prepared, now you can act. You can react to the situation you have. Because knowing what to do can be the difference between chaos and calm and even life and death. At Columbine High School, when I arrived shortly after the first shots were fired, I immediately went into the mode as being a, a paramedic and offering triage to students that had been shot multiple times that we could get out of off site to a rescue vehicle or someone's vehicle, ambulance had not yet arrived. And so we were able to get students into vehicles or a rescue vehicle to get to a hospital as quickly as possible. By the grace of God, all the students that had been shot multiple times outside or inside that we were able to get out of the building, they all survived because of the critical care that we could provide to them on site and then at the hospital. That was a good thing. Those 12 students and beloved teacher coach that perished were either killed instantly or on the coach's side, a lack or delayed in the response led or contributed to his death. So knowing what to do can be the difference between chaos and calm or even life and death. I'm often asked by people, how did you know what to do, Rick? Did your school district have a crisis plan, much like Bloomington does? And the answer is absolutely we did. We don't take time to take it off the shelf to review it because it should be ingrained in what we know based on experience, based on skills, and then what I call cardiac assessment, what is right in the heart and mind. Because you're not gonna make a decision right every single time. It is what we learn from those mistakes or decision making that makes us better the next time around. So when you have a massive response like we did at Columbine High School with 750 media outlet, uh, outlets at the peak of the response, uh, operating 24 hours a day, there were far more of them than there were of us on the response team. For weeks and weeks, in fact, it was well over a month before the, the, those uh, terrible tornadoes in Norman, Oklahoma, that the national media moved off site from the Columbine High School tragedy. Um, so it is about being prepared, bad stuff happens. So what do we know about what we want to do in training staff so that you can feel assured as parents and residents of Bloomington that our team and every school is prepared to deal with the crisis that occurs. What it comes down to is trying to understand how the brain works. And the work that I've been doing over the last five to 10 years in terms of brain research is how best to respond to these mass casualty incidents. Actually, it started along uh, about in 2012, um, I'm sorry, in 2002 after 9-11. What we are trying to do is figure out why did people survive and why didn't people survive in the towers and the other locations where the attacks occurred. And the myth was that people panicked, and so they didn't get out of the building quick enough. The reality is we don't panic. By and large, we have what we call an acute stress response, fight, flight, or freeze syndrome. And it's how, you're, how our makeup is that determines what it is that you and I will do in a, what I call high stress, high anxiety incident that occurs. Because when that does occur, your cognitive function and manual dexterity does all kinds of weird things. That's a good thing, because that's a defense mechanism. Your brain, in essence, is trying to find a trigger to tell you what to do and how you will respond. And the more we understand that, the better prepared we are for helping our staff and those that are going to respond to an incident to know what to do. The normal coping mechanisms that we deal with become very overwhelmed. So how do we distill this down to where the brain finds that trigger in order to respond? We call it mental simulation. So when we do those drills and training, it is not as a rote practice. It is intended to simulate a real world situation without freaking each the students and staff out but helping them to prepare and preload that brain for when we need it to respond to an incident in our school. Training enhances mental simulation. Why is that? Because we default, to, we default to what we know and are taught. The more we train, the more we drill, the more we develop that trigger point in our brain. It's why law enforcement, 
It's why fire, it's why EMS and paramedics through their training are constantly doing that. It's, that, it's the, uh, trying to understand how you will respond. For us, it also comes down to two critical pieces. One, it creates the cultural condition to know what to do when a real world situation occurs. So when the school goes into a lockdown and it is not a drill, what is the brain doing? It is looking for the trigger that says, what do I do? And as we train our staff about what to do in a lockdown or evacuation, it is almost instantaneous. Because what we have seen is when there's a delay in the response, is when people have a tendency to put themselves in harm's way because they haven't thought through or they don't know what to do. We saw that at Columbine High School. When students could flee, they fled the school. Now, did that save a lot of kids? It did, but it also put them in harm's way, including the teacher coach, Dave Sanders, who lost his life. Students were running into harm's way instead of locking down, which was the protocol that, yes, the school had drilled and trained, but it was not, a, not a, a, at a point where you created that cultural condition. The other thing is the teamwork needed. We have to rely on each other, not only during, but also after. Because if it wasn't the teammates that I had, that we had, and even today, we would not survive as an organization. A crisis, as some of you business leaders probably know, is one of the most difficult things to recover from. And there's lots of uh, reasons for that, not only internally, but externally. What you see on the screen now are photos from a recent joint full-scale emergency readiness exercise of an active shooter event. We held three of these over the last month and a half with our partners at Bloomington Police, Fire, and Alina Health EMS. And in a year, uh, it took a year in planning to develop this for the purposes of simply being able to train with all of our teams in the, in the interoperability that goes into uh, responding to a crisis. Our emergency response teams at the school level and district level were activated each night, two sessions per night spread out over two weeks, as well as law enforcement, fire, through all, all every fire station was involved in some capacity, and Alina Health EMS had upwards of 20 paramedics that responded on scene and actually transported our uh, 30 role players each night um, so that they had an opportunity to respond to a real world situation. It's the first time in six years since we developed the school district safety plan that all of our staff leadership, our nurses and those that are on emergency response teams had a chance to put in practice what we've been training and drilling for. So how do we, what are we doing in Bloomington to create safer schools? One of the things is that we, it is really important to share, and one of the hardest things to do as a parent of kids uh, is to tell parents and residents that there's nothing out there, a program, person, or system in place that is 100% foolproof. We have done a lot and spent a lot of money on safety, both, uh, as I said, uh, physical structure and otherwise. But if someone is hell-bent on causing a lot of damage and hurting others, will, they will find a way. What you don't hear about are a lot of those averted incidents. They're not sexy enough for media to talk about those kinds of things. Probably the most high profile one you might recall is the student in Waconia that had a hit list and had been making bombs in a storage unit that a parent of a student at one of the Waconia schools, I'm sorry, not Waconia, Wasika, that called police. They saw something, they said something. And they were able to avert what had the potential to be a mass tragedy. So being prepared is being proactive. There's no simple solution, but I'm here to share with you that there are some not only simple solutions to resolve uh, in terms of preventing a crisis, it's how we can respond and be better prepared to balance that really difficult piece about school fortresses versus welcoming environment. Now, school districts, every time one of these bad things happen, have a tendency to, for optic reasons, want to jump on some bandwagon or the latest product that's being pushed out there to make your schools safer. New security-oriented design uh, measures are often crisis-driven. And when we make decisions in a crisis, they're usually bad decisions because oftentimes those products or services are not supported after several months or are really still in the R&D. 
and at no time should our schools be a research and development factory for crisis uh, measures when we are talking about human lives of students and, and staff. So in the absence of those security standards, schools are likely to amass a collection of things. It's really critical as I work with school districts or uh, do presentations like this in school districts that we focus on having an approach that works for that community. Some of you, as I look across the room, were involved in conversations we had seven years ago when we started developing the school safety plan. We needed to understand what were the values as parents and community residents had with respect to school safety. Are your values of school safety should be reflected by the school system, which is no different than a microcosm of our school community. Those conversations helped us to develop these programs and pieces that were put in place. So what we do know though, the most important prevention steps are promoting a positive pro-social climate and culture in our schools. That means that we have programs in place to ensure that we are not letting disenfranchised, disengaged students fall through the cracks. That we're identifying students that are dealing with mental health issues and sometimes significant. That we have threat assessment or risk assessments that help to identify students to get them the help not only either in our programs or externally programs through hospitals or mental health uh, um, uh, businesses or programs. It is also not only teaching and modeling those pro-social behaviors, it's addressing the kinds of issues that sometimes creep up like bullying, harassment. All of those kinds of things are addressed in our uh, programs like positive behavioral intervention services and other intervention programs and staff to deal with those kinds of issues. That's the best and most important prevention steps where the best money is spent. Because speaking from experience, you don't want to have to deal with the crisis, the magnitude of a Sandy Hook or Columbine or Parkland, Florida, which is millions and millions and millions of dollars. And not to mention, which you cannot quantify as cost, is the damage on a community and society in general. So we commit constantly to improving and strengthening all of our school safety and security preparedness response and recovery efforts. So since there is no one thing that we can do to keep students and stay, uh, staff safe, we multi-layer approach it. We have physical structures that I'm gonna show you as well as the uh, programs of training and drills that are in place. First and foremost, all of our schools are now equipped with what we call a single point of entry, better known as an access management system. Don't, gone are the days when we had the uh, visitors would pass through the off, uh, come into the school, be a sign that says, please check into the office. It was sort of a passive approach. Sometimes people would go to the office, most times they wouldn't. And either the secretary would have to go chasing down them or some staff member to identify and ask um, if they didn't have a badge, can we help you? Can we help you where you need to go? Now visitors have to pass through the office. Once the school day starts, all of our doors, exterior doors are locked. And actually this year we increased our security at our schools for before and after school. There is a brief window of time when schools are open to allow students coming in by and large, and then locked when the school day starts. They're open for a 15 minute period when the school is dismissed, and then they're locked again until 5 p.m. at the middle schools, which is when uh, the afternoon, after school program is done, 6, 6 p.m. for our elementary schools, for those students in the Early Learners Academy and the Kids Safari Program after school program that they're done is at six o'clock. Those doors, exterior doors are locked. That is what we, this access management system, 94% of every school across this country has an access management system in place. It is the number one deterrent next to a visitor management system, which is nothing more than a computerized system or process to authenticate visitors. Do you have a reason to be at the school? So gone are the days where parents used to come in because we forgot our lunch or forgot our books or forgot our jacket. They come now and they drop it off at school. They don't need to go to the classroom. We have lots of parent volunteers, by the way, and we continue to welcome all parents and non-parents that are volunteering in our schools. We have a very robust volunteer program that Debbie Belfry runs. They do a very good job of not only um, uh, working with the volunteers and making sure they go through all the background checks, but placement as well. They all have visitor ba they all have badges uh, if, you're, if you're a visitor or you're a volunteer. It's not that we're trying to create a fortress. 
what we're trying to do is be very smart about who's in the building and needs to be in the building. Because controlling access with greater security is the first line of defense for our students and staff. What we know about these uh, perpetrators, every perpetrator of a mass casualty incident or a planned event knows the facility. They know your, their school because as a former student or current student, former employee, current employee, San Bernardino City Unified School District, the estranged husband had been uh, that came in and shot his uh, estranged wife and two students in the crossfire in uh, April of 2017, had been in that school lots of times. They're also in workplaces. They know the facility. They know how to get around. They know in some cases those security measures in place. What we do know, even though you cannot profile a school perpetrator, a mass casualty perpetrator, what we do know is they know the site, one, and they don't like barriers. Because barriers is an impediment to do what they want to do. The more barriers we put up, the more secure and safe our schools are. So the first line of defense is a single point of entry. And exterior doors that remain locked with key access in some locations or those doors remain locked throughout the day and evening for that matter. The second barrier is what we call emergency preparedness. We have the ability to put our schools in a safe condition through the use of emergency or duress buttons, panic buttons in some cases. We also, when this happens, is if you have an individual that has gained entry into the school, the ability to very quickly assess the situation, put the school in a safe condition, will release all the fire doors to close and lock. They still allow an egress. There's not, a, there's not a chance that a student or staff will ever be locked into a school they, they, or a classroom that they cannot escape. But through the closing of those doors, they create additional barriers, particularly for those classroom wings. We also have one of the other most important pieces that we are finding that schools that don't have this, the easy access is make sure every classroom, every place that is a student and staff member school, they have a safe location to go through. Um, and that is by making sure every classroom door, every uh, office door has a key set that's locked from the inside. So staff don't have to take the time to try and find their keys, step out in the hall and lock that door. At Parkland, Florida, not only did the individual get into the school because of a prop door, but the individual was able to get into classrooms because that facility, it's a very large campus, that facility, a three-story building, very old, among the oldest of that school in Broward County Public Schools, they did not have key sets in all the classroom doors. A student was uh, shot and killed for holding the door shut when the perpetrator shot through the door. We shouldn't be having students try to hold the door closed. Key sets in, in every classroom door is critical. We also have video surveillance. And video surveillance, while a lot of people think it is, uh, it is a deterrent, in some cases it is, but over time most people forget there's a security camera in the facility. We use it for two reasons. One, it is part of our comprehensive monitoring system. We still require and expect staff to be out in the halls during passing period, outside when kids are coming and outside when kids are going. Providing that eyes on students and in the hallway when sometimes those bad things that happen uh, it started the nexus, sometimes the bullying, the pushing, sometimes out of fun can escalate into a situation. Video surveillance is comprehensive with our staff monitoring. And then every school bus in Bloomington, as you know, Bloomington has its own bus transportation, is equipped with a GPS unit that allows for video surveillance. All of our buses have video cameras on them, as well as an alarm button with two-way radio capabilities back to the transportation office. We were able to, as our scenario with our, our uh, life safety partners here in Bloomington and those exercises, used a school bus that we were able to test this system, which has been in place for about four years now. And the ability that our school bus drivers have to be able to report an incident beat anyone in the school reporting that or calling 911. In all of those drills that we did over the last month and a half, our school bus drivers were able to assess and immediately indicate there was an incident because the scenario, which nobody knew about, was a, a, a perpetrator started from the outside. We also moved six years ago to an incident command system. For those in the fire and uh, uh, police and life safety uh, field, you'll know the incident command system. It's just a common organizational structure and language used so that we can all talk the same language.
And it is a uh, single leader in terms of the incident at hand. So all of our schools have an emergency response team of individuals that have been assigned to a role that have gone through significant advanced training in incident command system response. They then can, when law enforcement or fire comes on scene, can interact with them and communicate what is happening and help to help those life safety partners in that whole process, as well as the district team and these other plans that are in place. A couple more and then I'm done. Training and preparation are critical components as you've heard me talk about. So we, not only does the state require us to do these 551 drills, five lockdown, five fire evacuation, and one severe weather, we do enhanced drills. We sometimes do unannounced, not to create a headache for staff and students and disruption, but because to replicate sometimes that real world situation. On, and I mentioned the joint full scale exercises. And lastly, we operate with these school safe conditions tied to how the brain understands and works in these high profile or these uh, high anxiety, high fear events. We want the brain, when we say lockdown, to know what lockdown means. It is not code blue, it is not code red. A former district that um, uh, one of the first school shootings I became aware of back in the mid 90s in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, Wauwatosa West High School, a former student walked in shot the principal dead and fled the building. What came across the PA system was Ichabod Crane is in the building. Everybody in that building knew that Ichabod Crane is the, was the code for lockdown except the two substitute teachers that thought it was the assembly that day and took their classes into the hallway where the perpetrator was now fleeing the school, absolutely walking into harm's way. Lockdown is what the brain is trained to, to identify. Same thing with evacuation, severe weather, and our shelter in place is where we have an incident off site, police are responding to it, it does not directly impact the school, but for the safety and well being of students, we'll shelter in place, business as usual um, when that occurs. What we have learned, unfortunately and sadly, in the last few years, though, is we must empower every staff member to make a decision depending on the situation that may be life and death. No emergency plan can account for every scenario, and therefore, staff are allowed and required to make alternative decisions. Sadly, we have to allow staff to and students and train them that if you have no other course to save your life and others, you find a way to fight back. Whether it's picking up and throwing something, screaming, yelling, attacking, whatever you can do if it's your last course. Never thought we'd get there, but we have to empower our staff and students to know what to do when that situation occurs. With that, I do apologize for the technical difficulties. Thank you, thank you to Bloomington Police, Fire, and our Alina Health EMS for the work that they do with us. And um, if you have time, I'll do, take questions. If not, I'll do it afterwards. One, perfect. Any questions? Do you tend to look to like former military, or what's, what's the characteristic if there is a common characteristic of the people that are hired for school security staff? Well, I was hired as a communications guy. Um, <laughs> a lot of my colleagues are actually being handed this responsibility because this is not something schools have. Larger school districts have, in some cases, police departments. Um, others have uh, persons that have experience in facilities or technology area. Um, so it's a lot of different, various different backgrounds. And we pull from learnings from military, police, fire, and also understanding the unique characteristics of schools. Um, unfortunately, sometimes this training that is offered to schools is not, they haven't been in a school in 30 years. So they don't necessarily know how schools work. And that's one of the most important pieces to understand is that Teachers, they're teaching, uh, they're, they're with kids all day long. Um, this is secondary, and yet we embed it in that understanding. Okay? One more? One more. Okay. Uh, just a real quick question. Any comment about the government and all the suggestions about arming the teachers? Uh, we vehemently oppose arming teachers for the simple fact that teachers are asked to do a whole lot during the day. And to arm a teacher, you put them in harm's way because the protocol that police have in responding to an incident is to neutralize the situation. The longer it takes for them to find that, to neutralize the situation or to be encountered by someone with a gun and they have no idea that's a teacher, is putting that individual in harm's way. So arming teachers is not the answer. Whether, whatever you stand on, on guns, we don't need more guns in school, we need less. 
Okay. Thank you, Rick, for Thank that you. presentation. Thank you.